Today we have another former Calvinistic pastor on the program talking about his journey in and out of Calvinism. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome back to Sociology 101. Today we have a special guest named Brad Saab who is a lead pastor, a church planner in the Montana area. Uh, who ends up leaving Calvinism and apologizing to his former congregation about misleading them. Uh, just really gives a humble um, a plea uh, to his congregation and explanation as to uh, why he felt like he was uh, particularly misled. Uh, talks about his own anger issues and some of the other things that he had to struggle with uh, through this process. Um, and he's real humble about this. He's not uh, just trying to be mean to Calvinist. He's actually very, uh, very fair in representation, saying that uh, his own mistakes aren't necessarily the mistakes of all other Calvinists and uh, very similar to my own journey, uh, both in and out of Calvinism. And I really appreciated him coming on the program. I want you to listen into that conversation. Before we go there, however, I want to thank our sponsors, those who have made this possible. Um, first and foremost, want to thank uh, James Avery Artisan Jewelry. I, I mentioned in the last program, um, I, 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 I get offers occasionally to do sponsorships, and I haven't accepted any just simply because it's not something I've really ever wanted to do. There's never been a product that I really wanted to talk about. But James Avery is one of those uh, uh, companies that I would probably recommend and talk about even if they weren't sponsoring the program because I've worn a James Avery ring all my life. Uh, I've bought jewelry for my wife uh, from James Avery and have always – uh, uh, appreciated this company as a Christian company, and they have some really great products. And so as you're thinking about Christmas and getting that gift for that special loved one, I pray that you will consider James Avery Artisan Jewelry. You can find more at jamesavery.com. Also, I do want to mention once again uh, to go back to the website at Sociology 101, and if you can be a, a, a patron of the podcast to help support us. Um, things like James Avery and other sponsorships helps us, but we could not do this without our patrons, um, our monthly givers that, that help to sponsor us. So if you want to give a one-time gift or if you want to help to sponsor and help make this program better and uh, to keep us on uh, on a weekly basis, I really appreciate all that can help support us. And we also uh, work with Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. Uh, I recommend them for higher education if you don't know more about Trinity. Again, you can find more information at Sociology 101. You can click on that classroom link and find out more information about them. Um, a link was sent to me this week from Bruce Spear, who's a, f a pastor up in Montana as well, a mutual friend here with Brad. Uh, and uh, he preached at, uh, Brad preached at Bruce's church uh, this, this last week in November, on November the 11th, a few weeks ago. And uh, it was titled Reforming My Calvinism, where he talks about how the Reformation is about not only being reformed, but ever reforming in accordance with the Word of God. And if this is not a sermon you've, you've listened to yet, please take the time to listen to it. I'll put a link in the show notes because Brad does a really good job just humbly uh, recounting his own journey in and out of Calvinism. And I think you'll hear that as well as we kind of dive into that in this program. So listen to this conversation. I hope that it'll be edifying to you. All right. Welcome, Brad, to the program. All right. Thank you, Layton. Doing well today? I'm doing great, man. I appreciate you jumping on with me uh, here at Sociology 101 and talking through your transition. Uh, I, I know some people may have kind of picked up on what's going on. You're a former Calvinist like myself. Um, of course, that means that most Calvinists are going to say that you were never a Calvinist to begin with because once one, always one in some people's minds. But uh, right. there's probably uh, evidence uh, from sermons and other places. I know I have some sermons that I recorded back on VHS tapes because I'm a little older, uh, but I imagine you even have some sermons, maybe even online, that prove uh, to those who may be skeptics that you really were a five-point Calvinist. Yeah, and if you asked uh, any of my opponents, they would happily tell you that I was a five-point <laughs> Calvinist. Um, anybody that was, uh, you, you've talked about before, there's kind of a club mm -hmm. uh, in Reformed theology, there's kind of... Uh, a club in Calvinism where you've got your friends and your brothers in Christ and you sit around and you talk about these things. And I was, uh, I was in it and regularly part of those conversations and never challenged on that. And then there were lots of people. I, I preached um, a couple sermons that uh, drove people out of our church. And uh, one of them was very plain, very clear because I was, uh, you know, part of the great thing about being a, a, Calvinist or having Reformed theology is that you can kind of say whatever you want from stage, and it yeah. doesn't matter how offensive or scary or uh, divisive it is. I was never trying to be those things, and I'm not accusing any Calvinist of being those things, but I would, I was like, let me be very clear for you. You don't have free will. Your will is in bondage, and I would, you know, say those things, and 
there were plenty of uh, opponents that left, and they would tell you that I was very clearly in that camp. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about your story. I know a lot of people are curious about my story when I tell them I'm, I, mean, you know, I was a Calvinist for over 10 years, and uh, not just a Calvinist, but like you, I was a hardcore Calvinist in the sense that I tried to convince as many people of Calvinism as I could. I went through a cage stage, uh, you know, portion of life where it was like uh, I would, I would, you know, passionately argue with those who didn't agree with me and, and was sure that I was right. I would have never dreamed that I would be doing a podcast uh, against Calvinism yeah. years later. And I'm sure you would never have dreamed that you would be uh, on the podcast talking about that. But to just tell your story. I, I know I, I listened to your sermon for those that are um, interested. Um, I, I listened to it and how you, you know, uh, you kind of start off with an apology, just kind of humbly apologizing for maybe misleading in the past. Talk about that kind of that process going through that and what that felt like to you. Sure. So what I think um, probably it would probably be helpful. It's at least it's been helpful for me to sort out. And I heard somebody else say this and it just clicked for me how I even became a Calvinist yeah. to begin with was really. Um, so I grew up in a, in a, in a church going family, but it didn't click for me until I started going to church with uh, friends and and a family that I lived with in 1999. So I, I received Christ, came to faith in Christ in 1999 in a, um, I hope I don't get you in a lot of trouble, but in a very seeker driven, very seeker sensitive church, like God uh -huh. used that um, very pragmatic approach to ministry. If it works, we're going to do it kind of thing. Right. Right. Um, and, and God used it and God used the people and I love them and I'm, I'm grateful for them. Uh, I started into ministry in those types of churches uh, and one of the things that I think was hard for me as a 20 something, you know, young 20 year old man that was just uh, aggressive and didn't have a whole lot of brain cells to rub together. I, I was um, I was always finding fault and negative in things. And one of the, the challenges that I would keep surfacing with with the whole seeker sensitive, seeker driven, purpose driven, pragmatic type approach was, hey, where's Bible? And right. there were really. Uh, I guess in the last you know twenty years there have been really kind of two groups that split from that. One was the people that went really relational. You know, they said, "Oh, well, this is not as relational as the New Testament church," and they kind of went and formed the emergent strand, right? right? So you, right. you go from that and you react and become emergent, and then there's this other reaction, and that was uh, really kind of the Reformed Baptist crowd. And through in my reaction to all things seeker driven. Um, I found Mark Driscoll and John Piper and Wayne Grudem. And these guys were saying things that I, I was like, you can't say that. That's not seeker sensitive. That's not yeah. seeker driven. And they were just like, here's what the Bible says. And boom, here we go. And I don't care how I hit you with it. And um, some of them, obviously I don't, I don't want to lump like John Piper's sensitivity and kindness in with uh, Mark Driscoll's forthrightness, right? Yeah, um, rashness. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, but I was young and aggressive and I loved the Bible and these guys were Bible, 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 Bible people. And I was like, that's my camp. And yeah. so, so I came to faith in the seeker sensitive thing. I knew I wasn't emergent. Uh, I wasn't in that crowd. And my other option was the Bible crowd. And so that's kind of how I, I got there. And the funny thing, the interesting thing with, um, with, how I came to faith in Christ was I, I got introduced to the idea through these guys. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know that I buy this predestinatarian position. Um, but then I started going to seminary and I hit a, I had a class where I was, I was familiar with it. And I was go, I took a class on John on interpreting John. Right. Right. And I'm preaching through John. I was a youth pastor at the time. And I was, I was preaching just verse by verse through the gospel of John for our student ministry. And, uh, and I got to John six you know, I made it through John 1, it's not by the will of man. I made it through John 3, you must be born again, right? And and I was reading uh, the one of the texts for the class was D.A. Carson's uh, commentary on John. And I was just eating it up. I was loving it. We got to John 6, and no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And I was like, that's it, I'm done, right? Yeah. Like, I, I, I can't <laughs> fight this anymore. And because I had been... I, I didn't know what presuppositions were at that point, yeah. right? But because I had been introduced via Ephesians 1 and Romans 8 and 9 to this controversy, I was like, it, it says that you can't come to Jesus unless the Father draws you. Like, there's, 
there's no getting around that, right? I have to accept this. Um, so that was it. So John 6 in my uh, interpreting John class and preaching uh, pseudo-expositionally through John uh, led me there got me got me to that. Now, I had a lot of questions, and this was important, and this is kind of important for the, the story now. Um, it was probably, I, I spent probably eight years really developing my Reformed theology and Calvinism. I used to pray. I guess how arrogant I was. I was like, God, let me be the one to reconcile free will and predestination. Let me, <laughs> let me be the one to answer this. And, uh, don't you know and Jonathan was, Jonathan Edwards already did that? You don't. You, yeah, <laughs> Luther did that. Oh like, yeah, it was, I mean, it's it already been done. done. Like, yeah, but, but I didn't know. You know, I had I had <laughs> questions, so I held the position, but still had questions. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. Yeah. Because, absolutely. Because because now I I I'm in a new spot. I'm in a new position. I find comfort in this, right? That I, I've got. I, I'm in this new position now, and. I've got questions about, you know, judicial hardening and things like that. I'm like, okay, right. I got I got to sort through that still. But it took me, geez, I was I, I would have called myself reformed or Calvinist, whatever term you want to use. And I know people make distinctions there, but I'm using them synonymously. Right. Um, I was in there, man, and uh, uh, like bondage of the will didn't hit until about year six. It was like, yeah. oh, that makes sense. And so I know from that experience that I'm going to have a similar experience with my, my new found freedom interpretation position. I don't know what the the correct nomenclature is for this. Right. But my new, my my new belief that God doesn't predestine people to heaven or hell right before the foundation of the world. Um, I'm going to find answers about five years from now to questions that I'm asking today. You know, it's going to, it's a journey and I'm comfortable with that now. So anyway, so, um, sorry. So that was a long intro to how I came out of it. So I, uh, so I was a lead pastor in Montana in Missoula, Montana, and was, uh, I took a, a Southern Baptist church and I reformed it. I made it a reformed Baptist church. We were still part of the SBC, but as you know, there's two strands really kind of dominating the SBC and I took them reformed. I only hired, I, I, I did not put that into our doctrinal statements. I didn't put that into bylaws, you know, nothing like that. I didn't make it an official position of the church, but um, I only hired Calvinists. I only hired Reformed theologians or Reformed pastors. Um, Before you go past you, that point, I, I really, yeah. I, th- this came up in Malaysia when I was with uh, David Allen just this last week, um, and they're having the same issue in Malaysia where – uh, Calvinism is kind of resurging in that area, and a lot of the, the young people are leaving the traditional churches and going into the Reformed churches, and they're real concerned. That's one of the reasons they, they brought us in. But um, but one of the things they highlighted is when D.A. Carson and others come to Malaysia, um, they will have these big events, but of course all the speakers are Calvinistic speakers. Uh, all their conferences, when they hire their churches, they're all, all hiring Calvinists. And this is one of the things the pastors were noticing. He said, you know, when we do our conferences, we we bring in all kinds of speakers that hold to the different sides and different views, and we hire all different kinds of people because for the traditional side of things, it's a side issue for, for, for the traditionalists for the most part. And so they don't necessarily hire based upon the, that particular doctrine. It, it's kind of it's like how many angels can dance on the head of a pen, and so it's secondary. But for those who are Calvinist, it's a different mindset. And I've said this a lot. But I wanted you, I wanted you to kind of speak to it from another perspective. Why is it that you hired only Calvinists? Is it because, like me, you I mean, when you were a Calvinist, you saw that that's a central that's the gospel by golly. Yeah, um, I you know I saw it as a secondary issue, barely. Okay, so right. I was in a um, we were in a a meeting of other pastors and I'll try to keep this as generic as possible to kind of protect, protect this person. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, he, he was saying, he was saying, if you're not Calvinist, you're not saved because you don't understand the gospel. It's a works based. So if you don't believe that you were saved by grace, then you are an anthema, right? This yeah. is the, the problem of Galatians. Irresistible. So that yeah, was, it has to be irresistible grace to be true grace. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can't, it's not, it's not synergism, right? It's monergism. Right. And so if you, don't get that, then you don't get the gospel and therefore you're not saved. Right. So that was his position. I wasn't there. All right. So I would hire, I would hire reformed 
pastors or people that were in agreement with me because why would I do that? It was, it was a pretty important doctrine for me. Um, that was my team. Uh, I, it, I don't know, man. I kind of got to this place where my team was no longer Christian. My team was no longer brothers and sisters in Christ and those who put their faith in Christ and call in the name of the Lord. My team was like, you're, you're reformed, you're Calvinist. Like, do you agree with this or not? Here's the thing. I, I think for me, people who weren't Calvinists were not Calvinists because they were emotional crybabies. That's just really kind of <laughs> where I got in my head. It's like... Yeah. That, that's exactly the way I thought of it too, brother. I was like, it was like either you're Joel Olstein or maybe even Rick Warren, you know, a step up, um, and you're you're in you know seeker sensitive. You you're wanting to reach people. You're practical. You're a good person. I mean, you're you're a decent good person, but you're not really theological, you know. Yeah. And the only reason you're really, if you even know about Calvinism, the only reason you're rejecting it is because, like you say, you're 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 being emotional. Uh, and you're dismissing it for emotional reasons. That that was the mindset I had about non-Calvinists too. I I, I I have to admit that now. Yeah, and and late, like honestly, that that came from experience. That wasn't yeah, from no, me too. Yep. It, it was. I would be like, listen, here's hell, and that's bad, and uh, people have a lot of trouble with that. And then, oh yeah, God predestines people to hell, and then there's all this weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Right? It's like, oh, I could <laughs> never believe in. I don't. And I'd just be like, listen, then. If you can't believe in a God who would do that, then you just don't believe in the God of the Bible because here right. it is. Yep. Right. And so I think it became a litmus test for me, for for leaders in our church. Like, are you an emotional basket case or can you submit to the scriptures? Yeah. And in my <laughs> mind, Calvinist was submitting to the scriptures like like and I would. It was really interesting, man, the harshness and, and anger that developed in me through the process of just. And I don't know that Cal everybody has this conversation, like, why are Calvinists so mean? And I, I think it kind of draws a certain personality type. But then there's this other aspect that I, I think you really reflect on society, your portrait and picture and understanding of God, you know. Yeah, and so yeah. anyway, so so I would only hire these guys if they were kind of in my emotional set of able to accept the the teachings of the tulip, able to accept that, that God is just sovereign over every meticulous detail. Right. So right. I, I think that was probably it. Um, now, well, yeah, so go ahead. I, I, well, I could go on. Another yeah. Comment, it but... Talk about like it, people always ask me, what was, what was the, the thing that won you over that got you out of Calvinism? What was the, you know, the one thing. And, and I always try to tell them it wasn't, it wasn't like one day I just woke up and this happened. It, it was a, it was a period of time and study, slowly letting go this point, slowly letting go of this point while trying to cling on to it <laughs> desperately because I really wanted to stay in the brotherhood and be a smart person <laughs> because, you know, I, I really yeah. had the mindset. I, I, that was one of my, I, I was, a, I was a Calvinist for, I mean, I was a non-Calvinist. I'd left Calvinism for a good, probably seven years before I even told people about it because I didn't want Calvinist to think of me like I used to think of non-Calvinist because automatically yeah. they're going to think I'm dumb and, 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 and not really, really educated. And so I didn't want people to think of me that way. And so I really didn't want that out there. Um, and so it, it took a while for me to process for, for coming out of Calvinism for me. And it was a lot of separate points. Um, judicial hardening was one of those points and, and, uh, you know, Mark four kind of passages of hiding things in parables. Why would he do this? Um, the, the whole concept of the messianic secret. Why does he tell people, you know, keep, keep this quiet, you know, don't tell anybody about this yet. If he wants everybody to know, then, yeah. then it, and once I understood the context of what Jesus was doing, that's really kind of what started breaking down the walls, so to speak, to go, Hey, well, maybe that means something different than Calvinism when he says, thank you, Lord, that you've revealed this to babes and hidden it from the wise and learned. Maybe that's not Calvinism. Maybe that's uh, God's strategic plan to choose messengers who are fishermen versus the, the high and mighty uh, know-it-all Pharisees. Maybe, maybe that's more of the context that's going on here. And so it was just little things like that. Maybe when it says, uh, you did not choose me, but I chose you in John 15, 16, he's actually talking about his choice of uh, the apostles who were, who were weak vessels, relatively speaking, um, to bring the message to the world through them. And it wasn't about individual you know, individuals being chosen to believe that message through some irresistible means. And once I started seeing those things, it was just a small little breaking away of, of Calvinism. What about for you? What, what kind of led to that process of moving out of Calvinism? 
Sure. Well, so one of the, the keys for me was just being soft, uh, soft ground, like unhardened ground, I guess. Um, and the way that that happened was, so I was, I was a lead pastor of a church out here for three and a half years. And as I mentioned, I was kind of reforming it. And what I was doing simultaneously was sowing lots of seed of discord and discontent. And I, I, I've had to own this and take this before God and ask forgiveness of various people as I come across them. Um, now, but what ended up happening was I, I late. I was miserable as as a lead pastor because, um, really largely because of my anger that was tied to my theology. Okay, and so I was divisive. I was angry. So anyway, I, I ended up miserable. I ended up resigning. So my plan and hope and dream for ministry was that I would uh, pastor one church my entire ministry career. That was my desire. I didn't want to jump around. I didn't want to climb. I didn't want to, you know, relocate. I just wanted to one group of people and then I die, you know, like that was kind of my plan. Um, but I resigned, I resigned because I had created a entire, um, sphere environment of hostility and division. Okay. I had done that and, and others responded in kind. It wasn't, it wasn't one-sided, but I definitely, Led that ship. So anyway, so I, I and you, and you were lost. clear, and you were clear. Just to just to note for our listeners, you were clear in your sermon as you were earlier in even this this discussion to say this is your testimony. Uh, you're not saying every Calvinist has these these anger issues or these problems. Um, and and that that I even said that in my book because some people say, well, you're accusing a Calvinist of being this, that, or the other. And I said, no, actually, I, I was real clear to say. This is my story. This is what this is how God brought me through this, and so I'm not trying to accuse everyone of having the same feelings or sins that I, I necessarily had because they hold to similar theological views. Yeah, a- absolutely. This is this is me. This is mine. I think you can like it, that would be an absurd position for for somebody to listen and say that Calvinists are just automatically angry. Yeah. Um, like John Piper's looms large on the theological landscape. And I look at that guy as a pastor. I'm like, I hope that one day I can be that kind and pastoral and patient. Absolutely. Right? Like, like that's, that's not a fair accusation for all Calvinists. Well, um, and to speak on John Piper, he came and spoke for us at one of our events. And I've dealt with a lot of prima donnas and, uh, people who are, are, are rude and all kinds of things behind the scenes who are pastors or, or notable speakers or, or music musicians. Um, and John Piper is the opposite of that. Absolutely yeah. the most humble, kind-hearted, tender-hearted man I've ever I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And so we just want to be clear in saying we're not trying to accuse uh, all Calvinists of being like this. Matter of fact, there's a lot of Calvinists who bring charge, John Piper being one of them, uh, and, and challenge young, the restless types uh, to, yeah. to take a, take a break and, to, you know, to, to calm down and to stop being so angry. And he actually has a podcast answering the question, why are Calvinists so mean? And he talks about the very thing you mentioned is that sometimes that draws in a certain type of person that's already struggling with maybe some of these issues like we saw in, in, in you know, and I don't want to besmirch Mark Driscoll and what he went through. Cause I have no idea his, his yeah. own issues and we all have them. Um, but I, I just wanted to bring out that point because this is, this is your story and how God has kind of brought you through this process. Yeah, and it, it was. And I just, you know, one of the, just to kind of close that thought out, I, I think, I forgot who I heard say it. It was either Matt Chandler or, or John Piper at some point. But they, they said, you know, if you really get irresistible grace, that you were truly chosen apart from anything, like that is one of the most humbling beliefs that you can hold is like, I, I truly did nothing. And, um, and, and God elected me for salvation. And so instead of being an arrogant wretch about that, you should just be broken and grateful. And I see that in some, several Calvinists. Yeah. I'll, I'll be gracious, several, uh, some. <laughs> uh, right. I, however, was one of the angry ones. And uh, right. I was one of the hostile ones. Um, I loved, like, you got to understand, like, I loved Driscoll. That that YouTube clip of him just going off on men, I was like, this is just one of the best things. Like, how dare you? Like, I loved that. Like, I ate that stuff up. And well, um, it's, it's the Paul Washer's thing where he talks about, why are you clapping? I'm talking about you. Uh, it's yeah. like kind of just get in your face, n- no holes bar. I'm going to just, but I'm going to just beat you up with my words almost. It's just yeah. kind of, I'm going to let it, you have it. And Leighton, that was me. Yeah. That that was me. Okay. And so, and so I, that became a stumbling block for people. So, so the story was, I, I 
created misery and I was miserable in a lead pastoral role. And I was like, I'm out. I got, I got to get out. Like, I don't know. I'm going to go plant a church or I'm going to get into real estate investing. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I stepped down. Okay. And after a year out, we were going, so I was still reformed and we were going to an Acts 29 church, big Acts 29 church down in the Southeast. And um, they were big on church planting. And I was like, you know, I think we need to, I think we need to get back into this. I, I love Acts 29 or, or loved Acts 29, whatever at the time. Um, let's go talk to these guys about planting. I think we need to return to Missoula. I think we need to return to Montana because I left a call, which is a whole other story. But I went, I spoke to those guys and Leighton had this incredible church planting program where you come on you're on staff, but you really don't have any responsibilities for a year. It's four grand a month. Boom. You get four grand a month for this program. And then when you go launch, we're going to pay you another four grand a month for a year. So that it was like one of the best church planting setups for the pastor eating and feeding his family that I had, that I had come across. Right. Um, you, you obviously got to be Acts 29. Uh, yeah. And it was the church that was doing that, not Acts 29. So nobody go apply for Acts 29 for the money. But it was this <laughs> church that was an Acts 29 church that did that. Um, so I started, I go in, and I, I kid you not, like one Sunday we met with their church planting pastor. And I was like, dude, here we are. I'm, I'm Acts 29. I'm, I'm 1689, Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. Like, here we go. We're ready to rock and roll. I love rock music and i can tolerate people wearing skinny jeans so no big deal i'm in like i'm a card carrying member i'm, oh, I'm yeah. an x29 guy yeah okay we think we're going back to missoula we think that we found it my wife was stoked she's like woo back into ministry and we're gonna eat it's gonna be awesome like we're, we're headed back in and we get to set it up our own way this time yeah, and yeah. uh sometime in that week an opponent who is a um an independent Baptist missionary in Japan sent me a YouTube video of a guy. Um, I think you've come across paths with him. A guy by the name of Kevin. I think it's Kevin Thompson. Yeah, I, I know uh, Kevin. The Beyond yeah. the Fundamentals yeah, he, guy. He, he interacts on our, our website pretty very regularly. Yeah. The, yeah. So he. So my opponent, who had left my church in Montana because I was a Calvinist and went on, he went on to become a missionary. He sent me a video of Kevin Thompson uh dealing with ephesians 1 yeah. which the sermon that you listened to that i gave dealt with ephesians 1 i just started there because that's where it started for me right and he just dealt with it exegetically there was no right. emotion weeping wailing he dealt with it fairly aggressively which was not well, nice. yeah, so kevin was kevin's pretty uh, straightforward with his words <laughs> yeah about kevin. yeah which was it's probably good for you you probably needed that it, you might need to do that it huh? was it was absolutely good for me it was good to not deal with a, a very sensitive soul at that point right i don't yeah. want to i don't want to begrudge the more sensitive saints out in the body but just like it was good for me to kind of get down in the mud and fight with somebody and um yeah. and it created massive doubt right and so so that was sometime during the week that was the, that was after so i have this meeting on sunday for church planting and then sometime during the week and I, and then i was like Something just happened. Like something just something just came came loose. Like we've got an axle loose here on the on the Calvinism wagon of Brad, yeah. right? And uh, <laughs> and I think it was like the next Sunday or something like that. We went back in to kind of meet with the church planning pastor, and I was like, I think I need to like like I'm good, I'm solid, I'm reformed, but I got to go find an answer to this. And he's like, Do you need to find an answer? Or are you changing positions? Do you need to sort that out because you don't want to be planting a church when you're changing positions. And I'm like. Four thousand dollars a month. I'm sure I'm just sorting it out, right? Like, it, like church planting funds. Learn how you guys do ministry. There's, Don't worry, yeah, I'll get this sorted. There's nothing about uh, like being paid by the people that are controlling what doctrinal stance you hold to to be able to be objective with it. That's for sure. Dude, which has become a whole new concern for mine. We'll get, we'll, I, we'll get to that. That's like future. Yeah. But anyway, um. I think I messaged him back, my friend back in, in Japan. And I said, okay, that was, that was interesting. What else do you have? And then he sent me, uh, I can't remember. It was, it was a resource of yours. And I can't remember if it was a podcast or what, but I started looking you up and you're the, you're writing on the five points that, that led, led me out me of up. Calvinism. Right. 
um, I remember reading it. I was actually sitting in this this chair uh, in my kid's nursery in Florida reading this and co- going through. And I think one of the kickers for me, Leighton, was when you articulated that there was a third position, right? It's right, not right. – Calvinism or Arminianism because I knew I was an Arminian right like if those are my two options I'm a Calvinist all day yeah. without question well especially if it's, if especially if Arminianism is what Matt Chandler and John Piper and Driscoll described Arminianism as because let's just face it they didn't paint it in the most beautiful light um, even even our Armenian uh, scholars like Brian Ambashano and uh, you know the, the the leading scholars probably would not appreciate the way that uh, leading Calvinists today paint Armenianism as kind of God gets into a DeLorean as Matt Chandler puts it and travels into the future to see who's going to, to receive him and he chooses those people. I mean, when you're in your echo chamber of Calvinists uh, and that's and that's Armenianism, yeah, it doesn't seem real positive. And so yeah, that that was a big hurdle for me to get over too. Yeah. Yeah, that was when you articulated that, um, and I was starting to piece together, you know, really like hearing some of the things that Kevin Thompson, there was some link to what Kevin Thompson was talking about that I watched. I can't remember what, but I was finding opponents who were competent. I said this in the sermon that that you mentioned. Um, Like, I was always an advocate of if you want to know what Muslims believe, go find a Muslim. Yeah. Right. Like, don't. Like, it's okay to, I guess, talk to Christians about what Muslims believe, but, like, if you really want to know and get an accurate representation, go find a Muslim. Right. You know, if if you, like, there would, so much division on cable news would be solved if you would just actually let people (laughs) speak for their own position, because nobody's as crazy as their opponents present them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, But but it was that process, and I kind of, like, went to my... I'll tell you, it was it was a <laughs> it was a struggle because I I went to my wife and I was like, baby, I know that we've got a we've got a clear path back to ministry. We've got funding, and this church that we're going to is is really fantastic. Like God is using that church. We love that church, um, and they're going to teach us how they do everything, and then they're going to fund us and help us fundraise. And it was it was going to like we got a clear path back to ministry to plan. It's going to be amazing. And I'm sitting with my wife who was thoroughly reformed as well. Like. I don't have one of those wives that's just kind of along for the ministry ride. Like she's up in it. And um Yeah. How did that conversation sit- go? I'm really curious. It, it it was it was tough, man. And she was angry at me. Like she was uh and she she said this, um man, uh yeah, she said this like last week because this last week, when I gave that sermon on Sunday, it was like kind of the the closure of the decade. You know, it was yeah. like, okay, that was my that was that. Now what? Um, and she was talking, and she's 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 with me. We're in lockstep now, but it was a process, and she was mad, man. Um, oh, I'd imagine, yeah, I could see that. But when I laid out, she's like, what she said clicked for her was when I laid out Ordo Salutis, right? Was yeah. when I was like, listen, the main thing that we're discussing here is is whether regeneration precedes faith or not. Yeah. Right. If that's that's really kind of what it lays out she goes (laughs) well that's that's ridiculous and i was like (laughs) i'm like like, yeah well but that's you know you got to be born again and you got to you know you're born she she knows all the passages like she's very well versed in this but i was like you know you're born by nature child of wrath and i and i had laid this out um but this was part of my trickery right and this I'll, i'll note back to this like when i would preach calvinism like i would i forgot where i was um why I was preaching the text, I was talking about some of the pillars of our church or whatever, and I put Ordo Salutis up on the screen. And this was me. This is me being deceptive, okay? This is yeah. how I did it. I put Ordo Salutis up on the screen, and I've got Regeneration Precedes Faith up there. And I talk through, but I'm joking the whole time about how Ordo Salutis would be a great a great name for a metal band, like Ordo Salutis. <laughs> and, and I'm trying to be, yeah. <laughs> be That's like, funny. hey, hey, look at my humor <laughs> joke. Here's Calvinism. Do you agree? Look at my humor, you know. And so I would. This is me, man. Just being like, I know this is going to be unpopular when I say that you're born again, that regeneration precedes faith. And but anyway, when I laid it out, so coming back to the conversation with my wife, um, when I laid it out there, she's like, okay, I'm I'm okay with you exploring this. But I had to go back and tell the guy that was the church planter at our church, uh, church planting pastor at our church, right. like, hey, I just. I need some time to sort this, yeah, man. Yeah. Um, 
and it was there was no one point it just became this this month long uh thing but not month multi month process of listening to your podcast while I was washing the dishes and you know reading Potter's Promise and going back and and reading um what was it? Potter's Potter Potter's Freedom, right? James uh-huh. White stuff, yeah. and just just kind of going and sorting through and going. No, I have I have exegetical responses and reasons, right, to be able to step away from my reform theology, my predestinatarian views, and see. And what I began, I'll tell you what was really interesting was I, I tell people that my Calvinism gave me the tools to walk out of my Calvinism. And one of those things was presuppositional apologetics, which I know is a, a near and dear conversation for you. Yeah. Um, kind of talking about some of the, the challenges with presuppositional apologetics. Yeah. Eric, Eric Hernandez and I have yeah, done several podcasts on that. Yep. Yeah. It trained me, Leighton, to look for presuppositions. And yeah. once people started pointing out my presuppositions – because of my presuppositional apologetic training, I started seeing like, wait, I'm making this assumption. I'm waiting. I'm reading this. I'm isogeting this. I'm taking this into this and this and this. Um, I started seeing it and it just started coming together. And there was a day that I just woke up and I'm like, I think people have a real choice. Yeah. People can genuinely choose God. The offer of salvation is genuinely to all people. And I had, I, I've got exegesis to back it up, right? Like I've, I've got all that, but I woke up and I was like, I came to that, that thought. And I was like, I think people have enough will intact. That was my first thought. And then my second thought was, oh no. <laughs> $4,000 right? a month. <laughs> yep. That's right. It was like, okay, I just lost all of my friends and <laughs> What no, now? What does that no make the me? feeling? Yeah. And, and that was the, ch- it wasn't now, see, that was my fleshy response. Like a good spiritually mature response would have been praise God. The offer of salvation is available to all. And God doesn't predestine people to hell. Like that would have been a good mature <laughs> spiritual response. My response was, Dang oh, <laughs> <laughs> what do I want to do with this? Like, this is yeah. not good, you know. Like, um, which like was, some people are closet Calvinists because it would cost them their jobs, uh, in because they're in a traditional type church, and it's the same way sometimes coming out. It's like I can be a closet non-Calvinist because I'm in a world of Calvinist, and and I know how they're going to view me if I come out. So you kind of like, how can I keep this? How can I walk this line? You know, how can I still affirm enough reform theology to still keep my job? I mean, there's, sure. there's, there's those actual thoughts that kind of go through your brain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was, a uh, it's, it, which is terrible. Man. I know. Like, <laughs> like it's for selfish, both human sides, selfishness. It is. Yeah. Like, and, and, I, and I'll tell you, man, I was, I tried, I, I know that I told you, I tried to kind of distract in some sermons, but when I took a position at a, at a, it was a, it was kind of a seeker driven, but traditionally, uh, the traditional theological Southern Baptist Church, like I told them, I was like, I'm reformed. Like I said it to them. But here's the here's the challenge. And this is maybe something, you know, I know you've got friends in high places and things like that. But this is part of the part of the challenge with independent churches is I'm like, I read John Piper. I read Wayne Grudem. I'm really influenced by Mark Driscoll. I love Matt Chandler. Like you should hear in that Calvinism, Calvinism, Calvinism. And I told them, like, I'm reformed. Like all that right but the people who were hiring me were sweet godly people they had no idea what i was talking about they were not set up and equipped to go this guy's a calvinist who is going to completely change the makeup and positions of our church right and so there's this challenge right now in church hiring because i tried to be over i was trying to be a man of integrity and tell them like i'm here here's my spot Right. I didn't use code words. I used the language and tried to lay it out. But they their presuppositions were filtering what I was saying to them. And right. so you've got well, they see they, they see a young, dynamic um, preacher who they really want. They think you can help grow their church. And they're doing the same things that we all do. We, we want we, we we want to believe something 
and we want to believe the best about something. And, and if they know a little bit about John Piper, they know he's a godly uh, pastor and he's growing a, a good church. Matt Chandler growing a big church. Driscoll growing a big church. Hey, that's what we want. We want to reach people. They're, they're yeah. not really getting into the nitty gritty of uh, the tulip. I mean, they, they don't necessarily even care about that so much. Yeah, and so and, we've got this until weird it splits, si- sp- until it splits their church, of course. <laughs> then, then they then they start right. caring about it. Yeah, and I wonder about the, this. You know, you were mentioning the dynamic that you you saw going on in Malaysia. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I I'm not smart enough to figure out the the solution for this of how you equip churches to know what they're talking about. So what I've been trying to do is just kind of from a uh, from from the ground level. Right. Just tell people like when you go into a church, you need to have integrity. Like you need to find out the theology of that church and you need yeah. to tell them if you're very different. And just as a pastor, like, look, if you're if you're a predestined Syrian, um, Calvinist, Reformed, whatever you call yourself. Right. Um, and they're not like you need to tell them that and make sure they know. And I, I would even go so far as to try to talk them out of that because it's going to be a challenge. And I would go either way on that. If it's a Calvinistic church like I'd rather be above board and have integrity and say, listen, man, I'm just going to, I'm just going to tell you where I land and where you guys are. And here's where I'm here. Like give them reasons and things like that. But I think if you're a pastor listening to this, like you need to have integrity and tell people who you are and what you're about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I've heard uh, other, you know, Danny Aiken and other Calvinistic leaders within the SBC say the same thing. And so uh, I think we've got, we've got leadership on both sides saying, You've got to be really honest when you go into a church where you stand theologically and help them to understand what that means and how that will change possibly your methodology in preaching uh, and evangelism outreach, those kinds of things, uh, whether you'll do an invitation or not. Things like that can really affect some people's uh, view of church. And so if you go in uh, eyes wide open, then, you know, that's that's one thing. But if, if you're going in and being deceptive in any way or trying to subvert uh, people from understanding what you believe— um, you know, that's a, that's a whole nother thing. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't like for you, it, it sounds like t- it's the same with me. It wasn't like this, just one, you know, uh, particular passage or something. It sounded like Ephesians one was kind of the breaking point of the first one that kind of got you thinking at least. And then, and then hearing, Hey, there are other options to consider. That was the next thing. But you mentioned some things in your sermon that I wanted you to highlight for our listeners. Um, and I'm sure. going to put a link to your sermon and encourage our listeners to listen to that because I think you model humility, especially in the beginning, just owning your mistakes and then and then going through and helping people to understand a few things about how to confront somebody in Calvinism um, and how not to. Because I, right. I, I was listening to you and go, oh, man, that's that's just that's priceless right there. Go through some of those things, if you don't mind, uh, if, if if our listeners have one of a friend like you, uh, you know, a few years ago when you were a, a Calvinist give them advice on how they should talk to those friends who are in Calvinism. How should they confront it? How should they address those proof texts that they keep quoting at them? Um, how, how do you handle those things? Sure. So um, over, so the primary thing I would do is stay, stay exegetically. Um, and so what I would do is exegesis. What I would not do was this. So what I went through, and I've, I've got my list here, I'll just try to roll back through with the sermon, was don't confront emotionally, traditionally, pragmatically, philosophically. And then I said biblically to, for a little bit of hook. So each one just emotionally. Like if you would have come at me emotionally, we've already kind of dialogued about this. Was yeah. I could never believe in a God who blah, blah, blah. You know, kills and you can ba- say yeah. that about anything. Burns babies, you know, things like <laughs> that. Yeah, I like could that. never believe yeah. in a God who sends anyone to hell. I could never believe in a God who doesn't affirm my lifestyle. I could never believe in a God, you know, whatever. And you can put that in there. And so if you just come at me with – I could never believe in a God who doesn't give us free will and we're robots, then I'm like, I don't care. You're an emotional wreck. Right. I'm going to lump that in with all the other liberals, right? right? You're just a liberal and (laughs) bye. Right. Like, so, uh, secondly was traditionally, right. Um, and so don't, don't, uh, you could not have come at me traditionally. I've always been taught blah, blah, blah. This pastor, uh, who I loved and respected and was a godly scholarly man always taught me, but I'm like, I, I don't, your pastor was wrong. Yeah. Like, and, and what you've got to understand uh, what, uh, not you, I know you've got this, but like <laughs> others need to just kind of understand is the reformation and reformed theology and Calvinism exploded in reaction to tradition. Right. 
right? So it was the, the traditions of the Catholic Church, and then, boom, here's this reaction, and Luther comes out, and, and, and Calvin, you know, a generation later comes out, and, and all these guys are coming out, and they're railing and reacting against tradition. And so people try that same tactic, like the Catholics were trying to bring those guys back in, you know, recant, recant, recant. Look at all of these, you know, 1,500 years of church history is our argument. And yeah. uh, that's not an argument for me. Yeah. The argument for me is what does the Scripture say? Yep. Does that make sense? Am I saying no. that well? Yeah, no, you're, you're, making, yeah you're, 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 you're saying that exactly right. I mean, there, there's a sense in which, um, especially as a Reformed type of thinker, you don't don't just give me what Adrian Rogers said or Billy Graham said or uh, you know don't quote to me Agnosium John three sixteen and keep uh, emphasizing the word whosoever louder and louder each time that that just ferments that I mean that just makes me more firm in my Calvinism because it's revealing how uneducated you are about what really matters which is exegesis it's the Bible and that that sure. that's really the main the main issue for those of us who who were reformed the reason we're reformed is because we really love the Bible and we really think that's what the Bible's teaching and that's that's yeah. important and yeah and so that was actually one of my other points was biblically but did you want me to hit the really the other two the pragmatically and philosophically Absolutely. yes yep so pragmatically people would come to me and they would say well why would we do evangelism like it's this pragmatic approach well what's the point of us doing anything then because God's just going to save people. Man, no Calvinist is going to say that. Now, I, I think Matt Chandler does a great job of kind of articulating this position. It's because people are saved, right? There's some point in, um, I forget what chapter it is in Acts, where God goes to Paul and he says, you stay here, don't travel because because I have many people in this city. And so Paul preaches and many people come to faith in Christ. It's right. like people would come with this pragmatism and evangelism, like, well, if God just is going to save whoever he's going to save, then we don't need to do evangelism. Well, I never believed that. That was right. never anything I held to. So that wasn't a good approach. Uh, philosophically, they'd come and say, well, if God doesn't give us free will, then I'm a robot and love isn't genuine. And, you know, uh, A, I don't think most Calvinists or Reformed theologians would say that, first off. Right. My response to that was, I don't care if I'm a robot. Like, And I said this in the sermon on Sunday. I was like, if I could take a pill this morning that made me want to wake up early and go to bed early and eat vegetables yeah. and work out, yeah. like, I'd take that pill. Yeah, I've actually like, had Calvinists I, say that to me when, we're, that, when, that, when the issue of the, the puppetry or the issue of the you know how they interpret clay pot in Romans 9 um, is, is typically... Uh, equal to how the the puppet analogy or the robot analogy is, because a, a a puppet is no more in control of what the puppet master does than a pot is in control of what the potter does. And so, if you're interpreting it from that perspective of m removing human responsibility, then then those analogies do play. But th that was my response when I was a Calvinist. Was you know, I, I would love to be a clay pot in God's hands, and He's shaping me for. Uh, for a noble purpose, uh, I mean, yep. make make me a robot if that's what it takes. I mean, I, I'd love to be a robot in God's hands. That was usually my response to people who would accuse Calvinists, uh, accuse me of being, you know, robotic or puppetry. Yeah, yep. yeah. Please, please, yep. please make me your puppet, God. I'd love, to, I'd love to be your puppet. And that was usually the way we'd respond. But right. you're right. Phil philosophy did not work because we yep. always had, we always has, we always have an answer for the emotional or philosophical argument typically. Yeah. And then my last way of not coming was um i i called it biblically just kind of spark some interest but what i mean by that is i'd sit down with ephesians 1 and say look it says that we god predestined us in you know not in him but god predestined us to choose him before the foundation of the world yeah okay he predestined us before the foundation of the world can you see that it's in ephesians 1 <laughs> ephesians 1 1 through 14 you should yeah. read it it's the bible <laughs> <laughs> and what people would do is they'd go, well, John 3.16 says, blah, blah, blah. 1 Timothy 2 says, blah, blah, blah. Matthew, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like, yeah, Ephesians 1 <laughs> says this. And so what people would do is I would be in Ephesians 1, and they would jump to another passage, and they would create this in the Scriptures, right? Well, right. here's my set of... Here's my set of um, free will verses, and here's your set of predestinatarian verses, and boom, here we go. We're going to go at it, and we pick whichever one we like most. Right. And I was like, I've got all answers. I went and found my answers to answer all of your free will verses, and the, the example that I gave was, uh, what, 1 Timothy 2, right, was where God desires all to be saved. 
Well, right, that Greek right. word is the word pas, right? right? And that word, I don't care what denomination or background you have, that word gets translated to mean all without exception or all, all without, without distinction, distinction, right? Yep. It gets used both ways. It's like, and the way that I explain this to people is if I say everybody was at the game on Saturday. Yeah. Was everybody? All of, all of Montana is hunting this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's all without distinction, not all without exception. Yeah. So most people read uh, 1 Timothy 2, God desires all to be saved, as all without exception. As a Calvinist, I would go over to Acts, uh, where, where Peter was on the rooftop, and uh, the sheet comes down, and he's got the vision of the sheet coming down, and it right. says it was filled with all kinds of animals. Well, that's one Greek word. That's pos. the word pos. Yep. Same word. Yep. All in all, right? So and I would sit and I would say, okay, I just came to Ephesians 1. You just went to 1 Timothy 2, and I have an answer from Acts, whatever it is, it's 13, 14, right, right, somewhere right, in there, right. Acts 10. From and, Acts and, 10. And, and what you're describing right there, Brad, is that in a, like a microcosm, you're describing exactly what's happening worldwide right now, is the Calvinist, generally speaking, the young, the young restless, even the most, um, the less educated, even the most, the, the most least educated Calvinist out there, has basic answers for the typical Calvinistic proof text, like the First Timothy two four, Second Peter three nine, uh, Romans uh, three sixteen. Um, those major proof texts, Calvinists, because they 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 have to get that answer in order to become a Calvinist. And so, even the least educated Calvinists have answers to the the most used Arminian slash traditionalist um, proof text. What what is also the case, unfortunately, is the most least educated traditionalists, which are most of them right now, do not have answers for the Calvinist proof text of, of John 6 or, or Romans 9 or Ephesians 1 um, and Acts 13, 48 or some passage like that. They don't have answers for those things. And, and, and that's why you see a resurging of Calvinism is because the answers they're giving are the emotional, philosophical, um, uh, what, what, what you call volleying with proof texts kind of answers mm -hmm. instead of going, I understand where, where you go with Ephesians 1, but um, <laughs> have you listened to Kevin? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Have you listened yeah. to Leighton? Have you listened to Herschel Hobbes uh, read his book on this? Have you listened to this? Uh, you know, have you listened to the best scholars from the other position? And could you articulate in a fair way the way the best scholars from the traditionalist perspective would exegete Ephesians 1, for example? Can, can, you, yeah. can you demonstrate that? And if yeah. you can't, then I'm just, I'm going to be real blunt with you, just like, you know, not you personally, but you, the listener, I'm going to be real right. blunt with you. You're not qualified to decide which exegesis is better if you cannot properly describe the exegesis of the best scholars from both, both positions. You are in a state of ignorance still until you can, until you can explain both exegetical um, arguments from both sides, and then you can decide which one is most likely Paul's meaning but in my experience, and again, this is not true across the board, but in my experience, very few Calvinists can show or demonstrate that they know the exegesis of the best scholars from our position. Has that been your experience as well? That has been, and here's, here's the reality. I, I'm, I'm looking up a verse. I'm, I'm totally listening to what you're saying. I've got a friend that just went to seminary. He's actually down there in Texas, um, left Montana, went down to seminary, and I said this to him the other day. The most important verse in systematic theology, okay, which is what, for your listeners, is what we're talking about right now. We're just talking about theology, right? Most important verse in theology is Proverbs 18, 17. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. <laughs> if you are studying theology, find a competent opponent. <laughs> like, yes. find someone else. Um, but well, yeah, and that, well, and that is so true. I remember taking a class on eschatology and it was like the four views of eschatology and in each, uh, each section of the, this course, he would teach each view. And I, and I, I'm, I'm not lying to you at the end of every one of them. That's, I was like, that's what I am. <laughs> so yep. It's like after he yep. did the, the pre presenting it, I was like, Oh, that's what I am. No, no, no. And then the next one would come along and go, no, no, wait, that's what I am. 
And so, yeah, I think yeah. I think that's kind of the way it is right now in the microcosm of the world we have right now. It's like, how do we answer the question of election and predestination? Because it's obviously in the Bible. And Calvinists are going, here's the answer. It's all over the Internet. You Google it. You search it. Here's the answer. Yeah. And the non-Calvinist is relatively silent uh, on the subject. And therefore, it's the first answer people are being given in this, in, in this generation. And therefore, it seems like it's the only robust and good answer out there. And it's just simply not. Obviously. And it's it is robust. It is a robust is. answer. And that's the thing. And I think what we've got going on right now is people are coming and people are learning how to respond. I think there's a groundswell that is that is taking place. Look, like Calvinism had a resurgence. Like Piper and MacArthur and Wayne Grudem, these guys were around for a long time yep. before before Mark Driscoll and Matt Chandler made it boom. Right. Like made it really blow up. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and those of us with gray hair remember when they were nobodies. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> they, right. they, they used and to be so, less popular than you and me. I mean, they, they used to be quote unquote, nobodies just like the rest of us. And so that's, sure. this has been really recent that they've become the rock stars that they are right now. Yep. And, and I think there's, there's those characters and maybe, maybe you're one of those characters and, and others are one of those characters that are saying things. And you're just beating the drum and beating the drum and beating the drum right now. And it's I think there's going to be a groundswell um, that says, hang on, here's here's the exegesis on Ephesians 1. Here's the exegesis on Romans 9. Here's the exegesis on John 6. Here's the exegesis on John 3 and John 10 and John 1. And, you know, and like, let's like, let's hit it. And the, the whole point was, man, if I bring up Ephesians 1 as a Calvinist, you stay in Ephesians 1. You don't leave there. Now, you can use, I, I believe in I believe in Scripture, interpret Scripture, right? You can use other passages to interpret how the word predestination gets used, right? right? If, if Ephesians 1 says that I'm predestined, what my brain has been taught to do is think, oh, that means God chose people to go to heaven or hell before the foundation of the world. Well, hang on. Ephesians 1 says I was predestined to adoption. How does Romans 8 use adoption? It says that that's yeah. the um, the resurrection of our bodies, not the right. transformation, whatever it is. Right. It's a future event. Yeah, we eagerly right? wait for the redemption of our bodies, right? Right, right. So you're there. So you can use Romans 8 adoption to understand how the word adoption is used in Ephesians 1, but you need to stay in Ephesians 1. Right. right. Don't right. go jumping all over the rest of the Bible. Like, stay here. If I say Ephesians one teaches Calvinism, you need to stay in Ephesians one and say, hold on. It doesn't teach Calvinism. Let me right, show right. you how and why. Right. And I think to your point, dude, Calvinists are thinkers, man. And they're Bible people. Like, I love that. They're thinkers yeah. and they're Bible people. And I think that there are thinkers and Bible people rising up on the other side and figuring out how to use YouTube. And uh, I, I, I there are more and more robust answers from the other perspective. Yeah, that are starting to research. Uh, you know? Well, it, it's it's our time, and I, I know you have to go. You got to get to work, and and um, and and I've got uh, actually my boss has been texting me for some reason, and I probably need to answer him since um, you know we don't want to lose our money either. <laughs> we got, right, we got, we got people to pay for. But you, you mentioned John six in this episode. You mentioned Ephesians one. Uh, we talk about regeneration preceding faith, um, and and we didn't give an answer in the time that we had together of our position on this particular episode. But guess what? This is not the only episode I've produced. It's not the right. only, uh, you know, uh, time you've had these conversations. And so what I would challenge those who are Calvinists who are listening, um, if you don't know how we would exegete John 6 or Romans 9 or Ephesians 1 or any of the other proof text, then I challenge you to try it out. Try us out. Uh, go learn from the best of the scholars from our side and, and really find out how we understand those things and have a good answer and if you continue to be Calvinist, fine, but at least you know both sides now. At least you're better educated to be able to articulate both positions. Um, and so that would be my challenge for those Calvinists that may be listening in. And Brad, I'd love to have you on the program again and have more time to unpack some of these uh, these issues and maybe questions and, um, and how that's affecting even your life and family. I will say in, in closing, um, the Baptist General Convention of Texas uh, plants more churches than all of the other state conventions combined, including um, Acts 29. So if you're interested in planting churches, I can hook you up with the right people to talk to here in Texas. So just, God, just God let me bless know. Texas, man. That's right. So, and I'm not trying to brag. Well, I guess I am. I'm a Texan. So that's what Texans do. Um, and so uh, that's, that's a part of the pride side of our, our, our state. But yeah. anyway, uh, brother, I appreciate you. God bless you, man. And have a, have a great day at work today. All right, rock and roll. Thanks, Leighton. I appreciate the time. God bless, brother. Bye-bye. All right, see you, buddy. 
Thanks for attending our online university classroom. Remember, this is a listener-supported ministry, so please consider becoming a patron of the podcast by donating online. Join our team and help spread the word. For more resources, books, and articles from Professor Flowers, or to learn how you can support this ministry, please visit www.soteriology101.com.